This nomination is the result of an enormous amount of work spreading over 10 years, bringing stakeholders together, and particularly working with local communities, who are the custodians of this extraordinary legacy and of the memories of the thousands of people who worked the mines and quarries. And it is this important aspect that our speaker will be considering this evening. Dr. David Gwynne has been one of a team advising Gwyneth Council on this nomination. And as a native of the area, he spent his early childhood in the quarrying village of Beth Bethesda, when the huge Penryn Slate quarry was still at work. His interest in the industry led to the publication in 2015 of his Welsh Slate, History and Archaeology of an Industry, which is a wonderful book if you have a chance to get hold of it. He works as an archaeologist and heritage consultant and is the author of several other books on industrial and cultural history archaeology. Before I pass over to David, I'd just like to run through some housekeeping uh, matters. If we can, if I can make the screen work. Um, which I can't at this moment, here we are. Now, please could I ask you to keep your microphones and cameras off during the presentation. And after the presentation, there's going to be a mod moderated question and answer ses session to ask our speakers, uh, our speaker questions. And could I ask you to use the chat for your questions? And then our moderator will pass them on to me and I will then read them out after the conclusion of the lecture. And you are requested to be respectful to, respectful to other participants and speakers, as I'm sure and I hope you will. So without further ado, I would like to pass over to this year's speaker, Dr. David Wynne. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, can I ask, can you hear me? And secondly, can I ask, can you see me? Yes, yes. That's, that <laughs> looks good. Thank you very much. Um, now, I think we're going to run this um, with the, the slides. So I hope that I will be able to see the slides on my screen as well. If, if that doesn't happen, then um, I'm sure we'll manage one way or another. And I'm happy to assure everybody that we have every backup system known to the wit of man and woman for you this evening. We've got a voice only recording, we've got a voice and face recording, and um, one way or another, I'm hoping we'll get to the, the end of this evening, uh, having shared some thoughts about the square mile and the heritage of humankind. So first of all, thank you very much for coming digitally this evening. Uh, my apologies for the, uh, the technical problems that we had last time, whether it's deficient laptops or very limited broadband in narrow and remote Welsh rallies, I really do not know, but it's good not to see people, uh, but to know that you're all there. Um, so that's, that's very encouraging. Thank you very much indeed. Now, as Susan's just said, I earn my living as an industrial archaeologist. Uh, I am a native of Northwest Wales, and I have been working for or rather giving advice to Gwyneth Council for a number of years as part of their slate landscape of Northwest Wales World Heritage Bid, a cultural landscape bid which acknowledges the role of the slate industry of this region in roofing the world, in the production of roofing slates and architectural slabs uh, that was literally exported all over the world. Now, first of all, for those of you who aren't lucky enough to be familiar with the, the geography of Northwest Wales, or even, dare I say, know where it is, this is where we're based. There's Wales in red, 
on a map of Europe and the United Kingdom. And then lower down, you can see the county of Gwynedd, the top left hand corner of Wales, as people are happy to call it. And this is where our bid is based. It is made up of six separate areas, six component parts. And what I would like to do this evening is share with you some thoughts about how the very strong Welsh concept of the square mile, the square mile of memory and experience, can be acknowledged within and understood within and contribute to UNESCO's concept of the universal heritage of mankind. So let's have a look at the first of these areas. This is in the foreground, the village of Bethesda, where, as Susan has just told you, I spent my early childhood. In the background, you can see the Penryn Slate Quarry, which is still active, by the way. Um, the older workings are to the left, the newer workings in the distance and a little bit to the right. And you can see how the quarry is eating its way into the, the mountain slopes of Avronthwyd with the, the Carnedau Mountains in the background. So you can see here the strong interaction of working men with the natural environment. But what I think you can also see very clearly here is the way that the community is quite literally at the heart of the bid because our nomination includes the quarries, their transport systems, but also the, the villages and the towns and the scattered settlements where quarrymen and their families came to live in the course of the 19th century as this industry moved into its glory period. A word perhaps about the distinctive quarry landform that some of these sites exhibit. The Norwich Quarry, which we'll be seeing in just, here we are, yeah, in just a second, conveys very clearly the way in which men had to invest their skills and their physical strength into this landscape. Like Penryn Quarry, it has opened up in this system of galleried workings. So you can see in the middle there the stepped galleries where the skilled men or the men at any rate fortunate enough to be taken into a group of skilled workers actually work the rock where the quarrying took place and you can see also on either side the extensive runs of slate waste tips 90 percent at the very least in any quarry that works slate. So these are very important parts of any slate quarry's landform. Skill was necessary to quarry slate. Slate quarrying was a job for intellectuals because you had to develop a very sophisticated understanding of the rock, but it also meant muscle and brawn in pushing wagons along those level railway lines and tipping the slate waste as expeditiously as possible away from the working areas. Now topography and geology both dictated landforms. The Nantla Valley works the same vein of Cambrian slate as Penryn and Dinorwick, but because the veins here ran along the valley floor and along the, uh, the, the lower slopes of the Nantla Valley, the quarries had to be opened out as pits, not as hillside workings, and space for tipping rock was at something of a premium. What this slide also brings out, of course, is the proximity of these places to the sea, and that's absolutely crucial to the way in which the industry was able to develop, because these good veins of slate rock were within striking distance between five and ten miles of navigable water. That doesn't mean that some of these sites went in very secluded locations. Here is the Gorseva quarry in Kumstradlin in the distance and here there was no existing community at all and so in the foreground you can see one of the few deserted villages associated with the slate industry. 
somebody in the mid 1850s when there was a big demand for slate got out his ruler and pencil and drew on a map where a quarry village was going to go three parallel streets and a house for the manager in the trees down there to the right with no thought whatsoever to what it was going to be like to actually live on such an inhospitable slope uh, nearby Gorseda Quarry is the Prince of Wales Quarry and you can see here a site if anything even more remote it still uses this galleried system that you saw first of all at Penryn Quarry uh, but this is way into the mountains tips of slate rock again extending on um, contour levels and an inclined plane railway that took the raw blocks down to a mill for sawing and shaping. Slate mills themselves are very significant features within this landscape. Here's the magnificent three-story, very unusual slate mill associated with the Gorseda Quarry and this again was clearly designed by somebody who'd never been there and just wanted to construct an impressive building and because it's actually based on foundry practice and if anything it seems to be based on a foundry established by the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway at Miles Platting just outside Manchester. Nevertheless, it gives you some idea of the scale of investment in this industry when times were good and the problems of housing the, the workforce. Other quarries are in a much more urban environment, though it's true to say that the quarries came first and the urban development came later. The town of Bolina Festinog, now this is the most urban of the quarry settlements. It has formally laid out squares, it has magnificent rather flamboyant chapels, but it is utterly dominated by the tips of slate rubble that you see all around it. Festinog is different from the other places I've shown you because nearly all the workings were underground. To visit Festinog is to see certainly great big gashes in the hillside, but they were as nothing compared to the hundred miles or so of underground workings. Penryn Quarry, even though it's an open working, also has its underground features. This little length of railway line here, disused since 1965, but nevertheless I think if you put an oil can on it you could run trains on it in, in about half an hour. And Comorcin Quarry in Buena Festinog preserves a whole wealth of artefacts underground, not just big heavy lifting, literally heavy lifting kits like this inclined plane winding system, but small, rather moving artefacts, um, cigarette papers, shoes, boots, old newspapers. You're brought very much up against the world of the working quarrymen in the underground environments. That gives you some idea, I hope, of what actually lies within the bid, within the nominated property. What about the criteria that we've chosen? Well, there are three. An important interchange of human values, particularly in the period 1780 to 1940, and developments in architecture and technology. A landscape which illustrates in a dramatic way the combined works of nature and of man through large-scale exploitation of natural resources. I'll say a little bit more about both of those, but I think the one that's most important for us this evening, an outstanding example of the industrial transformation of a traditional human settlement and marginal agrarian land use pattern and exemplifying how a remarkably homogenous minority culture adapted to modernity in the industrial era. Because what we have to remember, of course, is that this is very much a Welsh language culture. And I'll be saying a bit more about that in a few minutes. Let's just deal with um, criteria two and four to begin with. Certainly the use of Welsh slate on prestigious buildings worldwide 
gives us some example of the, the reputation it had as a solid roofing material. Here's the World Heritage Exhibition Building at Melbourne in Australia, which was built between 1879 and 1880, a showcase for the achievements of the British Empire. So what more natural than that it should have a roof of Henry Slate on the dome. Ordinary buildings also, this aerial view from the 1920s of a big English industrial town gives you some idea of just how extensive use was made of Welsh Slate for covering very ordinary buildings, terraced houses, factories, warehouses. We calculated very roughly that the entire output of the Welsh Slate industry from 1780 to 1940 would probably have covered 13 million terraced houses. So that gives you some idea of just what a productive industry it was. It was an industry responsible for revolutions in terms of transport systems as well. Now, early overland transport was carried out by very simple, not to say long established methods, horse and cart. As I say, the quarries went far from the sea and for many years this was a perfectly valid way of moving slate, perfectly cost effective. However, once demand grew in the very early years of the 19th century, railways had to be built. Innovative narrow gauge iron railways on which from the 1860s steam locomotives were introduced. Now, the steam locomotive is a technology that's been around since 1804, but the big change that the slate railways of Northwest Wales made possible was the use of steam traction on very narrow gauge railways, two foot, two foot three. And this had a profound impact on railway building throughout European empires all over the world. This is the World Heritage Darjeeling Himalayan Railway in India which is more or less a carbon copy of the most famous of the Welsh narrow gauge railways, the Festiniog. It wasn't just in the British Empire that such railways were built. They were built in French and German possessions in the United States of America, Sweden, Pomerania, Russia. They served as trench railways during the First World War. Many thousands of miles of railways like this kept the trenches fed. So it's a highly influential technology that was exported from Northwest Wales. There's also abundant evidence of technology transfer within the industry. Now here is a reconstruction of what I call an artisan technology designed very much by local carpenters and blacksmiths, a water wheel driven ropeway system for raising blocks and rubble from Brinec Lewis Quarry in our sixth component part. And this is a technology that we know was introduced from the Nantla area, component part three, by a group of emigres from Nantla. Quarrymen emigres went further afield than the southern end of their county. This is Fairhaven Slate Quarry in the United States of America, opened in 1855 by Welsh quarrymen. What did they do as soon as they got there? Well, they, of course, built a chain incline system exactly like the ones they'd known at home. But because there wasn't water available locally and because there was coal, they powered it by a steam engine. The slate industry of France, of the Loire Valley in uh, Anjou, um, used similar technology. Whether they were directly copying Welsh practice or whether similar questions prompted similar answers, we don't know. But you can see here that this particular ropeway technology was constructed in France on a very serious scale indeed. This is a view of the Petit Cajot right by the, the banks of the River Loire in the main French slate producing area. In Penryn Slate Quarry we still have two of these wonderful water balance shaft heads, a technology introduced from the Glamorgan coal industry in the 1840s whereby a tank of water in one of the cages is filled and pulls up an, a cage with a loaded wagon. 
two of these, as I say, survived. They were still operating until 1965. And I think my, my baptism as an industrial archaeologist was when, as a little boy of six, I was given a ride in, in one of these things, which would cause, I think, apoplexy in a health and safety official these days. But so it was. So that's the technical story, but this is a cultural bid. Where do we start? And I think when we talk about the Welsh culture of the slate quarrying communities, we have to start with their deeply Protestant religious faith. This is a painting from the late 19th century showing one of the great preachers of the previous generation, John Elias of Anglesey, preaching in an open air meeting in Bala in the 1840s. It gives you an idea of the sort of deeply, deeply Protestant community based on visionary sermons that underpinned this particular cultural identity. Now, this was, if you like, a radical religious movement. Its early chapel buildings were very simple, plain, unadorned structures, like this wonderful one built in 1785, just outside Glenifestinog, exactly like a rural cottage of the period. But as religious dissent grew in importance, it became almost a new establishment in its own right, taking over from the Anglican Church as the, the arbiter of local society. And this resulted in some very impressive, some would say rather overbearing buildings like Jerusalem Calvinistic Methodist Chapel in Bethesda. And um, these, these sects vied with the church, they vied with each other. The Calvinistic Methodists were the, the biggest denomination, but you also have to factor into that the Wesleyans, the Baptists, the Congregationalists. So a non-conformist population. What about where people lived? There was no real existing population structure to permit people to find homes, existing homes, when they flocked into this industry, particularly in the 1850s and 1860s. And this particular location gives us some idea of how those challenges were met. This looks like a ruined cottage row. It's in fact a barn conversion. The barn was built here by a Cromwellian soldier who had made good in the 17th century, but by 1860 or so there was no real need for a barn any longer and there was every need to house families, single men perhaps might be courting local girls or men and women who were already married moving into this industry and to look around Penabryn these days is really to imagine just what it must have been like living in this teeming environment, lots and lots of young children, men working in the quarry immediately at hand, harassed mothers doing their best to look after their own children and those of their their neighbours. So this is very much a cultural landscape, not just of men at work, but women's experience as well, and children's experience. Some places were built just for men. This is the, the Anglesey Barracks, so-called, at Dinodric Quarry, erected sometime, we're not quite sure when, between 1869 and 1873, mainly for the labourers, mainly men from Anglesey, who would have had to leave home at about three o'clock in the morning, cross the ferry, walk up to the, the train, travel by train for an hour, then walk for another hour, it might be, into the quarry. They would stay here until Saturday lunchtime when they would go home, though there were dark suggestions that many of them spent their entire week's wages in the pub in Berlin Heli and their wives and children never saw them. But you can see that the same principle of the cottage row is here being constructed as terraced rows, but these are still in a way vernacular dwellings. Early urban development is the same. Um, these houses in Tanagrisha in Blenifestinog are still in essence farm dwellings, but they've been amalgamated or built as, conceived as a row of houses. Other 
houses in Bologna Fistignog reflect much more the standard industrial style of the United Kingdom in the in the 19th century. You can see here, this is a row such as you might have seen in Preston or Bolton or Birmingham. Brick has been imported, but the main structural material is a locally quarried stone. And of course, the, the roof is local slate. So I suppose it'll be clear to you, ladies and gentlemen, that we are presenting to UNESCO some magnificent sites, but we're also including the very ordinary, the very local, the very specific within this bid as a cultural landscape. And that leads me to what I would like to explore with you this evening is how do we combine the very local, the very ordinary, the very specific within the context of outstanding universal value, which, as we know, is essential to any successful World Heritage bid. Now, when I started thinking about this, I began to ponder the nature of the word universal. And let's give some thought to this. Ecclesiastics have always spoken of the universal church. Now, without tracing the context of the universal any earlier than the Renaissance, I'd suggest that Christianity's emphasis on the descent of humankind from Adam and Eve has always emphasized the commonality of humankind. And the idea of a Christian center with an infidel periphery used to dominate Christian thinking, but could no longer do so after the 16th century and the voyages of discovery the establishment of the Spanish and the Portuguese empires in the New World. In 1681, the French Bishop Bossuet wrote a Discours sur l'histoire universelle, which proposes, like St. Augustine, a metaphysical appreciation of universal history as an actual war between God and the devil. But he drew purely on European and Mediterranean examples. His book ends with Charlemagne about 800 years before and concludes with an exhortation to the Dauphin to root out Islam once he's king. That's not how we understand universal any longer. I suggest that by the 18th century the notion of the universal had been appropriated by, claimed by, the philosophes, by Diderot, whom you see here on the left, and d'Alembert, whom you see there on the right, um, Diderot looking a little bit sly, uh, d'Alembert trying to suppress a smile. This is the front cover to their, um, their encyclopedia. Um, this is the Encyclopédie de Diderot et d'Alembert. This is their attempt to, if you like, atomize knowledge for the whole of humankind. Now, the idea of universality, of course, does become very attractive after the divisions of the 20th century, or I should say after the divisions that came to an end in 1945. We still live with divisions, um, a division between uh, fascism and progressive politics was brought to an end, one hopes, in 1945, but we then had the duality of East and West. We now live with Christendom and Islam again. So the universal is very much a concept that we need to embrace. And I suggest that human experience is always immediate before it is universal. The very greatest literature, the very greatest paintings may deal in timeless themes, but they always do so by localizing themselves and making them believable. And it's the way that these two inform each other that I think is central to our bid. Well, let's move on to our next slide. And here is Mr. William Williams, who was a quarryman in Dinorwick, who in 1969 is quite literally contemplating the devastation of his square mile. He'd worked in Dinorwick Quarry for most of his life. All of a sudden, it seemed very hard to imagine, but Dinorwick Quarry closed down 
and several hundred men were put out of work. And the photograph here of William Williams just shows the stoicism, but also the incomprehension of people who just could not believe that this had happened to their square mile. Now, I think that in any landscape of deep valleys looking towards a coastal harbour or a market town, local loyalties are going to become very important indeed. In Wales, the parish history was always a staple of Estevavod competitions in the 19th century. Um, it was a means of enabling budding historians to try out their skills without going to any great extent, uh, expense. Uh, you couldn't very well ask men who might be working in a farm or a quarry to go and buy lots of books. So the Estevavod history competition was so often, is so often, a history of the parish, which meant that you perhaps went and had a word with the vicar and you walked through the baptismal registers, you had a word with the oldest, uh, oldest inhabitants, you asked a friendly quarry manager if he could have a look at the, the minute books of the particular quarry, and so many of the excellent histories produced in the 19th and early 20th century were written. But there's also, if you like, an imaginative strand to the square mile, exemplified in the work of this woman. This is Kate Roberts, born in 1891, died in 1985, a writer of novels and short stories, nearly all of which are set in her own square mile in the Kilgwyn, Rostravan, Rosgadvan area, not far from Nantla, component part three. And her most famous novel, Thrydmelm Cuffion, which was published in 1936, takes its title from a line from the Book of Job. Thou puttest my feet also in the stocks, and look as narrowly unto all my paths. Thou settest a print upon the heels of my feet. The sobeist van hraid mel cuffion, roit in gwylio the horse firth, roit nor dar watnaid in hraid. The themes of so much of a fiction are the compelling and yet inescapable nature of this square mile. Many of her characters want to break free from it. Some succeed, but at a difficult personal cost. Some are confined within it. Some can never move. And although it might have its profundities, it might have its great beauty, it was so difficult to move beyond that without destroying oneself. Now, to be fascinated with the parish, and with one's own square mile is not, I suggest, the same as parochialism. Thomas Hardy expresses it very well. In The Woodlanders, he says of one particular environment, a small area of Wessex, here from time to time, dramas of a grandeur and unity, truly Sophoclean, are enacted in the real by virtue of the concentrated passions and closely knit interdependence of the lives therein. Okay, well, let's move from Sophocles to a 1970s television sitcom. Most sitcoms on the telly in the 1970s were really not very good. One that I always found quite funny though, is one called Vor Aber on Welsh television. Vor Aber means him and him. The difference being that one of them is South Walian for him, and the other one is North Walian for him. And it revolved around two elderly widowers living together with their children and their grandchildren in Cardiff. One of them, the chap on the left, Tum Thomas, who was a communist and a former coal miner from the Ronda. And the other one on the right, Ephraim Hughes, is a liberal, chapel-going former quarryman from Llanberis. And the, the comedy of this series revolved around something that Welsh people find eternally amusing, which is the differences in Welsh accent and outlook. Now, I'm showing this because I have fond memories of both these actors, but also because there would be perhaps a temptation 
to present a bid like this as very much a celebration of the male cloth capped working class of yore. Very easy to do, but it's not as simple as that. As I've already suggested, the role of women and children is essential here. Um, these, these were family communities, the square mile belonged to men, women, and children. I'll perhaps say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. There are also quite a number of, if you like, different communities that when we were preparing the bid, we felt we needed to contact. For instance, there is the community of people who interest themselves in narrow gauge steam railways. Now, the Talithin Railway in component part five was the first such railway to be reopened by volunteers, more specifically by Tom Rolt, the man you see here on the left with his hat on his head. And he's um, accompanied here by Sir John Betjeman, who was a big railway enthusiast, celebrating the opening of a new part of the station building. You can perhaps imagine just what a surprise it was to a remote, rather rural Welsh community in 1951 when they were suddenly descended on by hordes of Englishmen who were prepared to work for nothing, to do manual and semi-skilled jobs for nothing, keeping an old railway going. It wasn't just the eccentric Englishman who suddenly landed on their doorstep. Oh no, 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 no. It was the immoral Englishman because Tom Rolt was not merely living with a woman to whom he was not married. He was living with her in a caravan. And this caused some perturbation in Towin in 1951 and matters were only solved when the former manager of the railway, who was a deacon with the Calvinistic Methodists and hence widely respected, said it was really nobody's business what Mr Rolt's domestic arrangements were and that he should be just allowed to get on with keeping the railway running. After that, everything changed, and when Tom Rolt went into a tow-in shop, he was asked very solicitously, how's the little railway doing, as if he was nursing a sick child back to health, as I suppose, in a sense, he was. Now, railway communities, yes, would you believe it, digital communities of slate quarry enthusiasts. On Facebook, slate quarry enthusiasts has 784 members. I found myself when I posted some very recondite bit of information about slate quarrying at midnight, within about 30 seconds it has seven likes and 14 comments. So there are all sorts of, if you like, unexpected communities that feel they have a say in this bid, and quite rightly. I suppose I should say as well that the very first community that needed to be persuaded, although it didn't take a great deal of persuasion, was Gwynedd officialdom. And I will tell you how this happened. The day after the Tangotan Canal was inscribed, I made a point of buying my newspaper from a news agent, a friend of mine, who was also chair of the economic regeneration portfolio in Gwynedd Council. I waited for him to say, as indeed he did, isn't it wonderful news about the Llangollen Canal? And I said, yes it was. I waited for him to say, as indeed he did, couldn't we do something similar? And I said, yes of course, but you must drum up the political support. He said, no problem. And within a fortnight, I found myself sitting down with him and the chair of the council. Now, I would have to say, and I feel I have every right to do so since I do not work for the council, that throughout this process, Gwynedd Council has shown determination, drive, vision and intellect. It's very important to me to say that. At an early stage of the bid, 
several big consultancies got in stay in, in touch with the the council to say we can do this for you give us a lot of money we'll wrap it up for you we'll do it don't you worry and um i asked a good and wise friend with considerable experience in world heritage matters what did he think of this he said no no don't do that there's there's plenty of skill in your council people go with them they're quite capable of doing it themselves and so it has proved to be i'd also like to um praise the the very hard work the dedication of cadu the welsh government's historic environment agency and also the royal commission on the ancient and historic monuments in wales what we know the council has done and hannah joyce and roman evans from the council can perhaps answer questions about this carry out a series of community events and this has confirmed that there is very strong community support for the bid some of the elements within the bid have required some sensitivity now here is Penryn Castle and its parkland in component part one you may just about be able to see the quarry in the distance the owning family at Penryn Castle have not historically had a good reputation within the area there was a very bitter very long drawn out strike in the quarry from 1900 to 1903 and until very recent times many people in the area would not visit Penryn Castle which is now in the care of the National Trust now in recent times the owning family who are still around have said they are keen for reconciliation but another story has emerged very clearly as well which is the way that money derived from slavery passed into the family and was reinvested in the slave landscapes it's not only evident at Penryn Castle it's evident in other places as well but Penryn Castle and the whole of that valley up to the quarry is where we can see it most clearly so when our assessor visited Penryn Castle earlier on this year this was something that National Trust officials were very keen to make clear to her that the National Trust had been considering these issues that they had been in the forefront of showing the connections between the slave trade and sugar plantations uh, run by enforced labor in the West Indies and that this is a story about which they were perfectly open and honest it makes the point though that of course there are other communities again who maybe don't even know anything at all about the slate landscape of northwest Wales, the descendants of people who worked as coerced labor in the west indies and in other parts of the parts of the world and who may want to be brought into the frame may want to offer their own take on the bed other than that, we've had great support from, well, this organization here, Merched Hwarau, Quarry Women, a group of artists and activists shown here attending one of Gwyneth Council's community events, who have very much foregrounded the role of women in the slate communities and have been particularly active in a dig supervised by the Gwyneth Archaeological Trust at Penabrin, this is Penabrin Barracks, the barn conversion, where it was very, very interesting to note the artifacts recovered from this crucial period in the 1860s and 1870s. They weren't male, they weren't clay pipes or beer bottles, they were all feminine. There were things like hair clasps, combs, purses. So there's a real chance here to write the story of women in this cultural landscape the square mile of of women the square mile of childhood marriage childbirth and challenging circumstances the square mile also of children and the council has been very active in bringing children into the process asking them their opinions, developing a youth ambassador scheme, encouraging artwork 
you see here, um, which derives much of its inspiration from the strong regional tradition of slate art. Here's a splendid example from the early 19th century. Men would come home from the quarry with a block of slate and they or their families would produce these wonderful exuberant carvings which were used to decorate their homes. Now when I was a child these things were knocking around but nobody really valued them particularly. They said these are these are ordinary things made by very ordinary people. Well, why are they important? But you can just see what a splendid vibrant culture it is that's created these things. Now the square mile of children, well children are quite literally getting their chance to get out into their square mile, literally exploring the landscapes that form part of the nominated property and they in the fullness of time will come up with their version of events, they will rewrite the history, they will tell a different story about their square mile. Even if they leave the area, they will still have their stories to tell. And I was entertained when our assessor came, she asked one of these young people, um, would he or she be interested in a career in heritage? To which the answer was, no. Well, that's quite fair enough. You don't have to be about to become a heritage person to understand and enjoy heritage if the square mile is for everybody and universal value is for everybody as it must as it must be because it would not otherwise be universal then that's fine it's for all of us so there you have it ladies and gentlemen outstanding universal value the square mile restoration of community pride I'd like, just before I close, to say, first of all, thank you very much to you all for listening, to Anthea and to Susan at ICOMOS UK for arranging this evening. And of course, since it's nearly Christmas, I would like to wish you this lovely view of one of our slate quarries under snow. Happy Christmas and a prosperous new year to you. Thank you very much.